Kid, tell everybody a little bit. Let's start off and tell us about your background because you are a proud veteran of IBM, now Dell, Wise. You got a lot of stops. Yeah. Uh, Austin, Silicon Valley, Turkey, New York. Turkish, New York. Very proud heritage too. And let's tell us a little bit about your story. Hey, guys. Uh, and hi, everyone. Glad to be here. This is my second time with, with your class. Correct. The last class was in another building, right? Yes. It was much smaller than this, and over the past two years, it's grown. It has grown. Next time, we're going to talk about the state of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mark, uh, uh, I'm Turkish originally. Um, my background is in industrial engineering. Uh, um, I came to the United States uh, actually from Germany. I was an engineer for a car company, Daimler Benz, which is the Mercedes Benz. Uh, used to design cars, it was very boring for me. I just want to get into business. So basically, uh, I left the job, came to the United States to get my master's. Actually, I went to school partially here. I, got, uh, uh, I didn't speak any English. My English was worse than this right now, uh, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, uh, took some classes uh, for those foreign students, you know, that total <coughs> exam in the past and so forth. So I, I did all that. And, and got my MBA in a very small school in Michigan Falls, Texas, uh, called Midwestern State University. Uh, spent some time in Austin as well before that. And then uh, ended up uh, with a, a, a software company uh, uh, called Sterling Software out of Dallas. And from there, from company to company, the IPO, the division of Sterling Software called Sterling Commerce, then got acquired by uh, Southwest and Bell. As you remember, this is a little bit interesting in my age. But um, from there, with our friends uh, um, who were part of that IPO, public process, which is a lot of fun. Uh, we bought and sold a few small companies to larger companies, and finally I ended up at IBM, running their e-commerce division, internet division, this is back in 1997, 1998. From there, um, another company, Computer Associates, a big software company in security space. Speaking of security, you know what's going on? With that uh, Twitter hacking happened uh, just yesterday, market dropped, right? Cybersecurity, big deal, huge opportunity, huge risk, huge opportunity for everyone. So I've done security software a little bit. And then we started this uh, uh, big process with WISE. We uh, took WISE basically private as a public company, it was a bankrupt company, and turned it around over the past seven, eight years, and we just uh, uh, sold our company to Dell. Now I'm part of Dell. I'm running the Dell's cloud business out of Round Rock. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco, 20% uh, of the time. 70% of them are on, on a plane, and 10% of them are all the time I'm here in Austin. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Okay. Yeah, let's take a little bio for you all. Give you a little bit of context to the conversation. How in the world does a guy from Turkey who is an engineer at Dalmer Benz in Germany get his master's at, what's it called? <laughs> Wichita Falls. Wichita Falls, isn't that funny? How do you want to fix it? It's unbelievable. I'll tell you a true story. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, true story, it's, it's funny. Um, <laughs> You are all so spoiled with your iPhones, Android phones, everyone is connected, right? Think about 1989. Probably many of you have heard about it were born. 1989. Um, and, and in 1989, there is no internet as we know it. User groups, Usenet, you remember some of those mainframe networks? Um, but no internet. Uh, if you want to do Wikipedia, you had to go to a library. There is no Wikipedia, right? There is no Google, no Yahoo, no Facebook, nothing. Um, at that time, there, there are no cell phones, and, 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 and to do an international call would cost an arm and a leg. You know, you have to work a month, make salaries, make an international call at the, the, those days. So um, when I finished undergrad, uh, uh, I was working at this company, and, and, and one of my friends said, you know, look, we should get one of these MBA things. I said, what is an MBA? Well, Master's in Business and Administration. I'm like, what does that do? It's a good thing to have in your career. Um, <laughs> true story, I have no idea what it is. Uh, at that time, I didn't even speak English. I, I speak, uh, obviously, native Turkish. I speak uh, German and French because of my education, but never spoke English. All the English I spoke was Michael Jackson songs. <laughs> <laughs> Just speak it, right? You heard it? That's an album from the 1980s. Yeah, reflected my age again. So, to make so short, um, he said, let's, let's uh, get one of these things called MBA, right? It's, it's helpful in your career. So, so we started uh, uh, looking for booklets and, you know, uh, to learn more about colleges. So there was a thick book like this of all graduate schools in the world. And that book only existed not in a you know, bookstore, because there were no bookstores like you think about today. There was no Amazon like that. 
he had to go to a library and search for schools. And all my friends, uh, they were from more, you know, wealthier families looking at all these big schools, and I was looking for the cheapest school available. And Riverson State University was a, a state a school, state network, and they had a soccer team. And I played soccer at that time. I said, this is nice. Cheapest school has a strong soccer program. That's it. <laughs> I had no idea where Mr. Falls is. And when I ended up in coming to Mr. Falls, Texas, anybody from uh, that area in Texas? My man, I love this. I'm a lot right there. So, um, actually, I flew in to that airport, and I was the only guy that on the plane. It was a prop plane. I remember this, like, like today. Uh, uh, that was in 1989, 1990. And, and that was the How the Journey Start. Literally, How the Journey Start. And now uh, I'm in the Falls almost uh, every month, do a lot of work with the just graduate, with the president. And it's cool. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So after your BA, you want to look here right, yeah, for a while. And what were you doing here? So uh, um, basically, uh, um, after MBA, I spent a little time uh, uh, with a company called Kmart. For those who are uh, uh, not familiar uh, uh, with the retail scene, uh, Kmart was a big, big retail chain in those times uh, uh, in Texas. Now, obviously, Walmart competitively you know, gained a little bit market share over Kmart and Target's coming and so on. So I've done a little bit of work with, in, in retail. Because of my technology background, as you know, a lot of retailers are actually focused on technology for many different reasons. Um, technology is everywhere. Software is everywhere. Obviously, it's in our, our lives. So that's what I start uh, with, with uh, work at the MBA. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, got involved with this uh, software company called Sterling Software. We had offices here in Dallas, in Ohio. And we basically ran all the airlines. Our software ran all the banks in mainframes, the big computers and data centers ran basically businesses in multiple vertical industries, including uh, airlines and transportation, retail, uh, um, uh, my retail background help. They're running a lot of car companies, a lot of processing, a lot of data processing. And now this new concept called big data. Have you heard big data? I don't know if you heard about it, but if you haven't, read about it. Big data. Uh, contextual intelligence, business intelligence, these things are going to change our lives. Uh, every, every transaction, every, every uh, entry you make with Twitter or Facebook goes to a huge database. There's no privacy. You're being watched every day. Every message you put, every text you, you, know, you, know, you write, it goes to a system. And increasingly these organizations, these companies are looking at the data and making predictive modeling about what you like and what you want so they can do target advertising to you, to us. So uh, Kmart, Walmart, Target, retail companies are big on this. Big deal for them. So I learned a lot at Kmart about a year then and then started uh, this sort of software job. And they put basically the gear, the infrastructure, the hardware and software to make that analysis. But think about it in 1989, 1990 version of it. And at that time we didn't have obviously internet, but we had still networks. They didn't have private network and then the public network called the internet. And then from that on, as you mentioned, Mark, with IBM, with CA, with uh, WISE, we added, we added more digitization of information through the internet and the web over the past now, how many years? I'm going to forget those years, 20, 20 plus years. So uh, when I met you, you had proceeded, uh, I think we might have met briefly at IBM, but you were at WISE when we at least reconnected. And WISE has really been your real sort of crowning achievement today, Absolutely. at least in terms of the transaction. Let's, let's go through a little bit of the anatomy of what happened with WISE, because you, it's a great lesson in how you can take assets from a bygone era and find a new media or a new technology deployment of those and create some significant value. It's a great business study, sure. and it's been a great personal study for you as well. Why don't you explain to us, particularly because it maps nicely with cloud computing and all that's going on, the major trends that are happening today. Uh, tell us briefly, if you will, in layman's terms, what WISE did, how you fixed it, how it mapped to these new trends, and, and take us through the Dell transaction, how you got to sort of your position. Super great stories. There's a personal you know, aspect to it. Obviously, there's a professional aspect to it for also for our audience here. Um, basically, right before uh, WISE, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is important, I spend my time as an employee in larger companies, um, like Sterling Software, Sterling Commerce IPO, did a couple of deals in, in between, ended up with IBM, after IBM, learned how a large company works, or doesn't work sometimes, right? You, you learn good and bad. 
um, and, and I realized more and more that, that I want to I want to you know lead an organization because I, I like to uh, do certain things, learn how to things from sales to marketing to R and D to product management, all aspects of a business. And again, this is a technology context, but it doesn't change necessarily from technology to hospitality to retail. You know, learning all aspects of business helps you grow. In, you know, in your career. So learn all these aspects, what works, what doesn't work kind of thing. So I was at a company called Computer Associates. Computer Associates is a New York based company. Now it's about a $6 billion revenue, $20, $25 billion market cap, strong in, in systems management and security. They're, they don't do sexy stuff necessarily, they run the infrastructure behind us. You know, we don't know those kind of brands, but they run the infrastructure. When you're flying with an airline, uh, when you go to school, the systems, all the IT technology systems where you do all your work, actually in the back end, you know, is run by these companies and their technology. So they're infrastructure companies. So learned a lot there. Uh, the the uh, founding CEO was a Chinese uh, national. He started a company in 1975, 76. Uh, uh, basically learned a lot from him. Uh, uh, just you know, grew in my career. Hard work, obviously. Um, passion, key. You know, love what you do. I love what I do. So, so, so what happened is grew in, in, in the company. At some point, I decided to start my own thing. So I was looking at a few companies in Germany and France for us to go buy out and bring it to the United States because they done great technology, but they didn't know how to market the business. As we were doing some of these private placements, it, a few friends of mine, uh, one of my investors said, Tarkan, we would love to raise money for this deal, but before you do that deal, we had this, another deal called Wise. I said, what is that? You know, what does that mean? Uh, I said, no, there's a company next. I did not even know there's a company existed called Wise. This is uh, back in 2004. They said, can you come to California, uh, to Northern California? At that time, I was in New York. And said, they said, uh, can you do due diligence about this company before we, we put our money? We use you for that. There is no free lunch. Uh, you help us out with the due diligence. And based on that due diligence success, we'll give you money for your deal as an investor. So I said, you know, that's fine. And, Meeting new people, learning something new is always a good thing. Uh, so I flew in California. It was a it was a Friday before the Guru wrote the check for me. I had to do this on Friday. So I drove down from Palo Alto in North California uh, down to San Jose. It's about a 30 minute uh, you know uh, ride uh, without traffic. So go ahead. I'm like thinking to myself, let me learn about this company as soon as possible. Do an analysis and get my check and go back to New York and do my deal, right? Um, so I go in and I met all these unbelievable people at this company. This company started in 1981 as a green screen terminal company. Green screen terminals are those old computers. They have a green screen user interface. There's no windows, no web, no nothing. It's basically when you go to an airline today, when you buy an airline ticket, just peek over where the, uh, you know, the, 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 the service trips and typing your name and so on, checking your flight, you'll see those green screen terminals. They're old school mainframe connected down terminals. This company built those terminals and why stood for the original four founders, Mr. Wu, Yi, Bernie Se, and his wife. So four founders out of Hong Kong started this company and became a, a, a market leader in down terminals, but they were struggling and almost bankrupt years later. So I'm talking to the investors want to buy this company out as a bad asset, clean up and go IPO. That's their goal, their mind. So I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, oh my god, this is old stuff. You know, everybody's going web, everybody's going cloud, and you're talking about social, mobile, virtualization, all this big stuff, big data. All of a sudden, this green screen terminal company, I'm saying, what am I doing here? Uh, you know, just just wasting time. But I start talking to people, listening to them. It's very key. As you learn more about the people and what they're doing, about this company, I realize this company actually has a lot of assets. The investors who are going to do this other deal with me did not realize. And literally, that was a Friday, I said, I'm going to go back to these guys one more time on Monday. So the investors were kind of surprised. I mean, you want to spend one more weekend here? So literally, on that weekend, I met a few other executives, uh, asked them to uh, uh, for coffee and Never forget, on University Boulevard, Stanford, University Boulevard, right in Palo Alto, I'm doing back-to-back -back interviews with the executive team who've been there for 20, 25 years. Build a business, is unbelievable, amazing IP. They are so passionate still about their company. They work for the same company for 20 plus years. Imagine that. Today, if someone works for a company for five years, you call them a loser. These people work there for 20 plus years, right? Same company.
company, so much passion, you realize there's something here, right? There's something keeping these people together. So the IP was very interesting. I went back on Monday, the following Monday, stayed there for the weekend. My girlfriend's about to kill me in New York. She killed me at the end. Um, she divorced me. Um, I'm spending all the time with work, right? So we were a holiday mania. So I'm just talking to these guys. I love this company even more. I said, this is an amazing deal. I go back on Monday afternoon to the investor. I said, forget, screw my girl in Germany. I'm going to do this deal. So literally, we signed uh, uh, the agreement between us, and, and, and uh, I brought some of my uh, executive team from other companies I worked with, like IBM, CA, Computer Associates, other places I worked with, storage software, and we built an amazing team, also created a fusion with people who've been in that company for a long time, and new people coming together, we built an unbelievable operating machine with new IP, Amazing operational uh, excellence and also a lot of customer intimacy. Then I realized, I realized what an amazing brand this was, but it was forgotten. It was forgotten, it was dusted up, people didn't take care of it, and, and the management teams didn't do a lot of great stuff. There, are, there were a lot of great middle management people, a lot of great engineers, but they were forgotten in queues, in layers of the company. Senior management team got more excited about themselves and their paychecks and they didn't pay attention to the amazing people they had. In this business, the technology is not the product. It's all about people and their passion. If you have the right people with the right heart, this doesn't matter as much. This is very important, obviously, in the technology business. This is important too, but when you find this and this combined, unbelievable, and you had that there in that company. And in seven years, let me give you a lot of data point on this, it was a $30 million company. And I'm assuming everybody has basic math skills in the room, right? $30 million company, 7% gross margin, $90 million OPEX equals what? Via. Come on, yeah. Anybody in the room? $30 million revenues, 7% gross margin, $90 million OPEX equals what? Disaster. Right? <laughs> $30 million revenue, 7% gross margin means you're doing $2.1 million revenue and you have $90 million operational expense. So your headcount costs, your programs, so you are losing amazing amount of money. So this equals, my dad is calling me and saying, you are you an idiot? I mean, you know, did I spend all that money in your schooling for you to choose a company to become a CEO of a company like this? Now, tongue in cheek. We were talking, I said, you know what, this can be the biggest turnaround in the IT industry. Nobody knew. And I'll tell you, even though these numbers were so bad, it was an opportunity. When you see risk, when you see challenge in the business, in special technology, anything can happen. Anything. Look, 10 years ago, there was no Facebook. <coughs> Look what you can create with the right people and the right idea. So Wise was that kind of a company. It was completely broken, it was bankrupt. Uh, I remember, who does the energy bill here? Who provides uh, electricity in Texas? Where do you send your bill to? Mine's uh, TXU. TXU, right? TXU more than likely. PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, is the, uh, in California, the West Coast, is our energy bill company, you know, energy company. I had to delay a $3,000, $6,000 PG&E bill to make the payroll. To pay your salary, imagine the CEO is sitting down with the CFO and accounting team every week delaying bills, not paying them so we can make the payroll. That was where we were in 2005 when we closed our deal. It was a very difficult deal. There was a lot of debt in the, in the box, which means employees didn't own anything. Everything was gone. And the employees were working there just for their salary with no hope. But with the right IP, right idea, right market, and right passion behind that, from that $30 million dollar, in 2011, we grew into $400 million in revenues. We were 150 people that is sold to them. We were almost 600 people. Our gross margin reached about 50%, and our OPEX was actually $80 million. Think about that. From 2004, 2005 time frame to 2011, um, Dow and Michael Dow have been great to us. Uh, we competed against Dow. We competed against the PC industry. Because what we did was, Basically, what we call thin clients, devices with no hard disk. Hard disk are those disks in your computer turn where data is. Since they turn, they create heat. Because there's a heat, your laptop, your desktop, your Apple, whatever you use, gets very hot. That's why there's a fan inside. There's a little fan, and sometimes you hear that. If you keep your computer on 
for 24 hours, you know, for getting to turn it off, it gets sold out because the fan is having a hard time to keep the heat down. If that fan doesn't work, you create a fire in your house, right? It's very important. These little things are very important. These details are very important. Because of that moving part, and because of the fan, and fan moves, there's a lot of electricity. A PC needs about 300 watts of electricity to run. Imagine there are 1.5 billion PCs around the world. 1.5 uh, billion PCs around the world, and 300 watts per PC, so a lot of power. So we've done devices with no hard disk. Since there's no hard disk, there's no movement. Since there's no movement, there's no heat. Since there's no heat, there's no need for a fan. Since there's no fan, there's no movement, right? There's less electricity. We have devices now for one watt. They don't need necessarily a power port. They connect just to the Ethernet, and Ethernet, the network cable, has 12 watts residual power in it. We call it PoE, power over Ethernet. Power over Ethernet, PoE. From the Ethernet cable, network cable, the network cable comes to your computer and powers up your computer. Imagine that. Imagine companies and countries do not have enough electricity now can provide a fully powered up computer to do computing. And these devices now that are voice and video at the same time. Under hundred dollars. Imagine devices this size connect your TV or monitor and delivers your voice, data, video. Your phone, your TV, and your PC, all in one, all cloud connected, under hundred dollars, one watt, no power cord. That changes the game. It's not only a technology story, that's making the world a better story. Right? It's a green computer story, it's a cloud story, it's a big data story. That's why the company got so valued. I used to run a car drive a car, basically with no PC logo on it because we were so anti-PC. We gave so much hard burn to PC companies. We did every single deal with every single customer in every single part of the world. So what happened was Dow took notice. You know, they were losing a lot of deals to us and we were partnering at the same time. When Dow started selling more PCs, if the customer said, no, we don't want to have PCs, we want to get these things called Think Minds, Dow goes, okay, why is our partner? So we built a phenomenal partnership with them and as Dell was transforming itself from a PC company to an end-to-end -end solution provider, we just fit beautifully. Now think about this from a strategic perspective. When you sell a PC as a technology company, imagine you're Michael Dell, you're the CEO of Dell. You sell a PC with a hard disk. Remember, hard disk moves, heat, fan, all this complexity, noise, you're bored, electricity, you're not feeling good because you're dirty in the world. You don't have the devices, HP devices, you're making the world a worse place, right? Shame on you, right? You need to move the device as soon as possible. Uh, Joking on the side, as Dell is selling these tools now, you move that C drive in your computer, that hard disk where the files are now to the cloud. Once they move to the cloud, which means you need more infrastructure in the back end. So when I talk to PSG from Green Gamble or Citigroup or JP Morgan Chase or even UT, UT is my customer. UT is my customer, man. I'm selling labs, your labs, these thin devices, uh, and also the, uh, 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 the, the different schools within the UT ecosystem and Texas uh, as a whole. What they're finding out is they're selling out more servers, more storage room for networking. So in the future, these cloud-connected devices are going to get thinner, they're going to get smarter, but they're going to be even zero. We, we, we don't call them like PCs, fat clients, and thin clients. Now we call them zero clients. There's nothing in them. All the intelligence comes from the cloud, and those devices are smart and they're connected. When they're disconnected, there is nothing in them for secure reasons. So there's a new world of, of Dell because of this wise acquisition. So it's been a phenomenal run, and that's a little story. I know it's maybe longer than you expected, but I just want to share. There's a context behind all of these things. Right market, right people, right operational excellence, and a lot of passion. You cannot be successful in this business if you don't like what you do. And our people, they're crazy. They're crazy. They love what they do. When you lose a deal, when you lose a transaction that against the competition, we go nuts. We go crazy. Why did we lose it? How can we lose We're a very competitive company. So that's why we grew our business from 30 to 400 in such a short time frame. There are not many companies that look at this tough economic environment can grow in those rates. Uh, and, and as a hardware company, making 50% gross margin, profit, profit, gross profit, is it unheard of? One of the most successful companies, Apple, makes about 30, 37% gross margin. We beat Apple's numbers. Our growth rate was faster than Google. Uh, and one of the things we did, uh, you asked me this before last year, we gave nearly 30% of our business equity 
to our employees. We said, if you're successful, if you work hard, you're going to be part of the ownership. So the employees, the people we hired, they were unbelievable and they were okay for working for lesser salaries, which helped me as a CEO to manage my OPEX. <coughs> lesser salaries but higher equity, meaning when the company gets sold or IPOs, now, now you're not worried about your $100,000, $200,000 salary, now you're going to check profit for $10 million after working there for three years. Think about the upside in this business. There's no industry, like technology industry, that these numbers can be achieved. It's an amazing place. And the beautiful thing is, every day is changing. Every day there's something new happening. Every day, literally, there is some new innovation which excites me. Well, it's, it's a great story on so many different levels. First yeah. of all, your father's recognition that, I mean, it was truly one of the most contrarian decisions that you could have made because why is technology, at least from an external perspective, was dead and died. It was a bankrupt company, and it was old school technology that seemed to be headed for the junkyard. Absolutely. So to have it make such a dramatic turn of events is, uh, is really, this is a huge story in the world of tech to the degree that, that Wise has been turned around. And, and the fact that you have the vision to see it. So you, you touched a few things. You talked about when you got in, part of the enthusiasm was, um, was the loyalty. And, and the enthusiasm around the employees, right? Absolutely. Um, a part of it was just that you had a recognition that, that you found some technology that you thought could be beneficial in the future. Did you know when you first looked that, oh, the world's going to the cloud and everything's happening now up in the sky and thin devices are going to, did you really have the vision that the trends were heading your direction? Or was it just a fundamental appreciation that there's $30 million in sales, there's some enthusiastic employees, I, I, I can do something with it, I just don't know what. So, very uh, good question. I get this question a lot, because since my transaction happened at within Dell now, as I'm running the cloud business for Dell, I get this a lot of questions from Dell employees and also investors as well. Very good question. Um, when I looked at the uh, company at that time, during that due diligence, during that weekend, the conversations, to be honest with you, 50% of the reason was the people. They were so passionate about the company. That's a very important thing. Um, whatever you do in your life, it's up to you, professional or personally. But I would love to surround myself with people who are excited about their life. Like, not this all about a work or school, but life in general. Um, you need to you know, love life to be successful in it. If you, know, if you think life sucks, you're not going to be successful. For so, so um, no matter what, in this difficult situation, these people love the company and love what they're doing. So that wasn't 50%. The next 50% of us some of the pieces of the IP, intellectual property I saw, some of the software, some of the hardware. And also, I had some checks. You have to ask a lot of questions. Definitely, before you join a company and before you get married, ask a lot of questions and do background checks. Yeah. So, so, I've done that. So ask Which one you successful at? Both, 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 similar wise. Um, so, we looked at the companies around WISE doing business with WISE also, what I heard was fundamentally, even though company was struggling, but good people, they were responding to problems and so on, and they were, they had this product, it wasn't a cloud product, nobody talked about cloud in 2004, cloud computing and so on, it's just maybe the last three, four years, before that, nobody talked about cloud, nobody talked about virtualization per, per se, virtualization is a new technology also, in, in, in high tech office is a big deal, and we'll talk about some of the trends in a second, but to answer your question, I saw some of the IP, some of the software that was very really unique. For instance, um, do you have an iPhone? Do you have an iPhone? Yeah. Um, so your iPhone is your iPhone is one of, my, one of my favorite devices. It's a thin client to me. Typical PC runs Windows, right? Or typical Apple device runs basically Mac OS, its own operating system in it. Usually those OSs, operating systems, run and need a space minimum three gigabytes, minimum four gigs. Uh, in Windows 7 case, almost five gigs. You need to have room, memory, to run that uh, computer, right? It's a lot of space. In iPhone or an Android phone, that goes down from four gigs down to, let's say, 100, 150 megs. 150 megabytes, right? <coughs> These numbers are important. Four gigs to 150 megabytes. Why is engineers figure out that operating system was only one meg? Think about this, this is 2004, one meg. That CEO at that time was trying to kill that business because he said, you're not an operating system company. We're selling devices, in his mind, and the executive management mind was, we're selling devices, we should just put windows on it. 
why are we competing with Microsoft? Doing an operating system. Do you get it? Do you understand so far? Are you with me? Someone is doing an operating system. They are the monopoly almost with Apple now. Obviously, let's say Apple and Google on mobile phones, and let's assume Microsoft on PCs, right? Monopoly almost. They own most of the operating system world. And this little dinky company bankrupt. Remember 3790 rule I gave you? The disaster story? My dad's phone call story? Yeah. And these guys had this operating system built on one megabyte. The typical presentation or Word document I work on is two megabytes. How is it possible they created this operating system on one megabyte? To me, that was an Einsteinian, if there's a new word, innovation. <laughs> you like that? I do like that. She likes it. <laughs> She's still laughing. Um, so that operating system changed everything for me, which means, which means you can deliver that operating system from the servers to the people's zero devices. Think about this for a second. Today, when you download an app, that app comes down to your Android or Apple device from the cloud as a service. Those apps usually are three or four megs. Imagine there's a firmware, there's an operating system for one way. That was the key thing. I didn't go to this cloud. I didn't you know, think about it as a cloud connected, but what I was thinking is we can use that operating system and OEM to others and create a new cloud connected device as a device ourselves or OEM to other people and make it a new generation of zero clients. Because most of the problems related to the devices are the security, the manageability to, to maintain those devices not only for the consumer, but for the enterprises. It's a nightmare for CIOs to manage these devices. In a typical bank, even in your school, your IT administration spends three, four, five, six thousand dollars a year just to maintain the security, anti-virus, the backup and recovery, the availability of the applications that you're using. You have a fun, text and this and that, but where do you get that information? AT&T, Verizon, spend millions, billions of dollars to manage that data. And then the operating system is fatter, bigger, that security management is very difficult and costly. Imagine from 4 gigs to 150 megs on your iPhone, which is to me is a PC, it's just in your hand to a device with one leg and there's nothing on it. Since then, we have a new project now, we call it Project Freezer. Let me give you the analogy here. The names, the branding on these projects are very critical. Fat clients, thin clients, zero clients. I asked my engineers, I need to go below zero. They go, we have an idea for you, Project Freezer. They're going to go below zero for it. So we have now actually a new service, a desktop service. It's basically on the internet, using a new code uh, ecosystem called HTML5. Uh, I don't want to get too geeky, but you're using a new protocol called WebRTC and HTML5, basically, in layman's terms, a service through the web in which you don't have to even download plugins. Today, when you go to the web and do searches and so on, you actually download stuff to your computer still. You don't realize it. There are cookies. If you're doing a web-based application, there is a certain plugin. A, a piece of software you download. That's still fat. Imagine devices with no memory on them, and there is no plugins. There is nothing you download. You just type a URL, and you get your entire Mac OS, Windows OS environment in front of you, all your applications, in a kiosk mode. Meaning, meaning at any computer around the world. At any computer around the world you go, you don't care anything with you, you go to a screen, you type a URL, and you see all your data and files from one place. That changes the game. So this way, you, don't, you might not even carry a device with you to connect your information, unless you want to make a phone call. So you're changing the service environment, you're changing the desktop from the fat client to a thin client to a zero client, now to below zero with a service. So that's the next big thing as we're working on. All these pieces, was in this company. Did we think about we're going to create all these new technology that day in 2005? Probably not in this kind of an ecosystem, but we saw the pieces of it. We saw the pieces of the salad. We saw the ingredients, but we didn't see the salad and the whole dressing. Yeah. So how did you get, uh, let's fast forward. Um, you sold the company to Dell, what, six months ago? Six, uh, 12 months ago. 12 months ago, okay. And so you've been, uh, you've been working basically in the same capacity but now as a Dell of business unit. Correct. Very similar. Now it was a, at Dell we call this reverse integration, which means this was a very successful company. Uh, 400 million revenues last year. We grew during the last 12 months to 1 billion dollar, 1.2 billion dollar run rate. 
in one year, which is also in itself is a great story. When the acquisitions take place, when a large company buys a small company, usually revenues go down because there's integration, distraction, people leave. It's a, it's, a, it's a study itself. There are you know, hard business case studies written on, on mergers and acquisitions. It's actually went up. We just, uh, our run rate get, get up to almost 1.2 billion dollar run rate. Because of that, Dell did something very smart, which they call reverse integration. If they acquire a smart company, a good company, they actually put more assets to the company. So actually, we were 600 people, now we have about 3,000 people in our organization. Uh, a lot of Dell cloud assets now part of our assets. We call it cloud client computing business of Dell today. So you had a wonderfully successful run, obviously, with WISE. Talk to me a little bit about the future. I mean, you've, you've kind of covered cloud, and I think right. we actually we get a feel for thin clients versus fat clients. Tell me what you see, particularly for these folks sure. who might be uh, entering the work world in the next year or so. What do you see in terms of future trends? Where do you see those contrarian plays or those hot categories? Um, I spend a lot of time talking about futures, particularly about global and a handful of emerging technologies, usually in the context of marketing right. within the mantra of what we try to cover in this class. I don't know, words of wisdom, futures, sure. things that people might be looking for. Sure. So let's keep it from a macro level to a uh, micro level, um, without getting too geeky in terms of terminology from a technology perspective, but at a higher level. Um, from a CEO perspective, the companies that around the world, the big brands, small brands, doesn't matter whether you you know, work with, buy, you know, services and products from. These, these things are top of mind for investors and, and, and in a sense for the chief executive officers. What are those? Um, obviously, economic volatility, that creates a lot of anxiety. Economies in certain parts of the world are very difficult. Um, actually, in the United States, you're one of the best economies when you compare with the rest of the world. This with Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia. Um, there are few economies that are really stable. Uh, even in China, it's been doing very well. There's a boom economy, but there's also uh, expectations there's going to be uh, uh, some uh, uh, um, headwinds, especially in real estate business and so on. In the United States, actually, we're doing fairly well when you compare with the other nations. So, so um, economic volatility is the number one issue, is a driver. I'm going to tie this to technology in a second, but it's important. The context behind everything is very important. In any kind of conversation, always you know, dig deeper into the context. Uh, to get the truth. So economic uh, volatility, uh, compliance, it's a huge issue. Because what happened with Enron back in uh, 10, 11, 15 years ago, maybe you guys remember, maybe you were uh, way younger, but compliance is a big deal. To so making sure, uh, uh, we're a capitalistic country, we want to be capitalistic, we want to give freedom to our businesses and so on, but at the same time, some governance from the government is important to make sure the bad people do not go around the rules. So compliance in financial services industries, compliance in healthcare. You don't want your health records to be sold without your knowledge and shared with other people. Government protects your privacy with HIPAA regulation. I don't want my healthcare information to be on someone's device at home. I want that information to be secured and encrypted. So compliance, privacy in many industries hugely important. Be aware of that. Compliance is a big deal. Because these things create opportunities for people like us in the room uh, who are graduating with great ideals and ideas and opportunities. Be aware of these things, compliance. And then obviously emerging markets. Um, even though at certain parts of the markets are struggling, there is a lot of money to be made in the, in the world. I see sometimes business people like, you know, all sad, the, you know, market numbers are low. Emerging markets create tons of opportunity. And even in the United States, there are sections and segments and, and regions emerging markets for business. There are still states in our country who are not digitized yet. Go sell computers there. Build infrastructure there. Google doing a great job right now. They're building fiber channel in, in, in the state of Utah. They're moving that now from uh, Utah to Kansas. There's opportunity in our country. In our country, we have emerging markets. Think about emerging markets like Latin America. You know the BRIC topic, right? Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China. Now think about the other big BRIC countries beyond that. Just don't go with the cliche. Uh, um, I look at beyond BRIC. Look at Vietnam. Look at, look at countries like South Africa. Look at countries like Turkey, 80 million people uh, uh, with $20,000 per you know, GDP per uh, capita. Look at uh, uh, not only Russia, but all the countries around Russia. But we call the CIS countries, with Kazakhstan, with Kyrgyzstan, these countries in Asia with huge oil reserves, 
Look at countries like Angola and Ghana, huge opportunities. Um, Rina and I were talking, Trinidad and Tobago, right here, you're from Trinidad. Trinidad is one of the richest countries in the world with all the oil money coming in. Opportunities everywhere. Emerging markets are a big opportunity beyond just basic brick. Um, and, and having said that, Tying that emerging market story and understanding and learning more about the world, especially I'm looking at this audience, everybody is probably coming from somewhere else, and that's the beauty of UT, right? It's an international school, just learn from each other. This experience you have right now, the, the four years, two years, whatever your you know, uh, life is here, is the most precious time of your life. You learn so much and you can use that kind of knowledge later on when you enter into a job. When they ask you if you have an international experience, you don't have to travel around the world. You only meet with friends and learn from each other. And, and that, that's a, that goes a big way uh, in the urban markets, having that kind of cultural connection to those uh, you know, uh, countries in the world. Uh, another area is obviously CSR, corporate social responsibility. There's a lot of opportunity there. It creates a lot of opportunities for companies like us, building public-private partnerships with the government entities, not profit for profit organizations, from World Economic Forum to United Nations. We do a lot of work and make money. This is self-sustaining profitable stuff, right? Uh, and obviously innovation and technology innovation is a big, big, big opportunity. And obviously the last, last thing is understanding the finance. Regardless of what you do, communication, marketing, sales, business, whatever you do, learn how to read, how to read a financial statement. How to read a, 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 you don't have to be an expert, you don't have to be an accountant, you don't have to be a CPA, but you learn how to read a cash flow statement, learn how to read a you know, balance sheet, uh, learn how to read an income statement. When someone comes here and says, $30 million revenue, 7% gross margin, $90 million OPEX, if you had a hard time with that, I'm telling you guys, I'm trying to help you out, learn what those mean in simple terms. You don't have to be a PhD on this, but this is very important. Six degrees of separation, when I hire, if someone understands, you know, a little bit better finance, even that the person is an engineer, helps me to identify the right person for the right job. So having said all this, from an overall trend perspective, again, economic volatility, understanding what's going on in the world from an economic volatility perspective, understand the compliance issues, understand emerging markets, have a feel for that, understand social responsibility, public private partnership, understand what, are, what does innovation mean in your line of business. In your interest, whatever you're going to be an actor or you're going to be an engineer, doesn't matter. What are the new innovations in your segment? And understanding uh, the shareholder value, the financial understanding of a business, of your family, you know, home economics is hugely important. Now, tying these, I would say, this six high level trends in technology. If you don't get anything from this conversation that Mark and I'm having, make sure you take notes on this. Social media is a reality, it's going to happen, there's no privacy. Everything you put on the internet, everything you put within, within your digital ecosystem, wherever that is, it is there to stay. It's not being delivered by someone to be nice to you. They're going to be used for you, against you, around you, there's no tomorrow. Be aware of that. If you don't want to share something with someone, don't share it. It is very important that you understand that. Um, so social mobility, social media is a huge deal and creates tons of challenges of tons of opportunities. When there is a challenge, have goosebumps in positive ways. That's an opportunity to make money. When there's a problem, there's money. When there's complexity, there is problem. Always remember that. Social media creates a lot of challenges because of security and privacy, and there's an opportunity. Number two, uh, mobility. Everybody has a mobile device. There's a lot of uh, you know challenges around mobile devices, around security and management. Again, how you deliver applications, how you use applications, hugely important. So social media. Mobility. Number three, virtualization. Learn about this. It's a lot of techy stuff, but regardless if it's techy or not, learn about virtualization. It's a new way of doing technology uh, for hardware and software to cut cost of infrastructure. It's, it's, it, for those who don't have a tech background, it might be a little bit difficult, but you can learn in layman's term what this means and what kind of opportunity it creates. For the data centers and for the users, virtualization is a big deal. Social, mobile, virtual. The fourth area, which is a big deal, is convergence. <coughs> convergence in the data centers, now we're going technology, right? And convergence for end users. In the data center, things like storage, servers, networking, all these metal, you know, uh, 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 all these, uh, uh, um, what I call gear, that big companies put in their data centers, now being converged into one fabric. 
and it creates tons of opportunity for IT companies. And those IT companies are in tons of people right now to keep up with the demand. Huge opportunity there. But also, more importantly, convergence for the end users, for us. Think about this. Your phone is now your PC, your TV, and, 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 and your phone at the same time. Converging infrastructure. Now, think about it. Typical PC is about $1,000. As I mentioned this earlier, devices under $100 delivers you voice, data, video, <coughs> from the cloud. Changes the game. Today, there are phones at enterprise you pay for $1,000. That changes the game. There are 1.5 billion PCs. There are 7 billion people. Think about it. How much opportunity there is in this industry? We're just the beginning. We're going to laugh at this. When one, one day you're at our ages and you guys hit 65, you guys are going to go back and go, those two guys were talking on stage. They were such losers. Look at what we're doing right now with holographic images, right? It's going to happen. And there's tons of opportunity because of that. Converge is a big deal. Be aware of it, be about it. And last bit, last bit as I mentioned earlier, big data, the contextual intelligence. Contextual intelligence is going to be a big deal. I give this example last year. This is very important. Just pay attention to this very, 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 one second. When you go to Google and you search and you type, let's say, a word like Italy, you get 4 million uh, results. Italian restaurants in Austin, Italian restaurants in Bangkok. You didn't search for Bangkok, but it just shows up. Because some guy pays money to be listed on top, right? There is no context. Oh, Italian uh, schools, do you want to learn Italian? Do you want to go to Italy for a, a, a cruise, right? There's no context. Think about it in the future, and in the very near future, when you type Italy, and actually you're looking for an Italian restaurant in Cookie Town, Oklahoma, with your wife, and you're flying from San Francisco to go to that restaurant, I'm just making this up scenario, the search result is going to come in, in one or two items. Because the system knows exactly who you are, are you paying or not, where do you live? Why do you go? Why are you going to Cookie Town? Because you're a fan of over there. Because they're going to search about you. All that system, all that contextuality is now built into the systems. Some of the new applications coming on Facebook is exactly geared toward that kind of a goal. And there is a huge opportunity. I'm just telling you this um, as an advice. It's up to you to follow on this. People, students right now learning this stuff are going to make tons of money. This space is green space and there's not much interest in it. There's not much uh, intelligence in the space yet. Business intelligence, contextual intelligence, big data is going to be a big, big deal. Think about this. All the data, all data right now on the universe, okay, petabytes of data, are mostly, mostly unstructured data. Meaning, pictures, music files, things that they cannot go into your database. Most of the data is actually unstructured, almost 80% of it. And that data is not being harnessed today. But now with new technologies like Hadoop, learn about this. H-A-D-O-O-P, Hadoop. Um, it's a new way of doing data processing. It's geeky stuff, but it's going to be a household name, I'll tell you, in the next 6 to 12 months. This stuff is how Google works. When billions of people, billions of people are doing searches right now, how is that possible when you do a search in seconds you get results? A typical database does not do that. Now imagine millions of computers around the world, even your PC, are all networked to do that processing on your behalf through these new technologies and do, do, do an intelligence and, 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 and so, so to speak, relationship analysis on these, on these data sets, very, very difficult. Whoever resolves that first, they're going to make billions and billions of dollars. And some of these companies are on that way. They're making that kind of money. Today is a very difficult area, but whoever solves that, and more than likely you're going to you decide in this country, because all this brain power in this room and beyond, it's going to create tons of opportunities. So again, social, mobile, virtual, convergence, and contextual. And doing all of these things in some shape or form from the cloud is a big deal. I know it's a mouthful, I know I'm going too fast, but I'm telling you, man, it's a power of now. We need to move fast. On that note, let me give you one quick story. You're going to love this. I'm in Russia, and I'm doing a, a presentation like this to a school. Uh, and then we went to a meeting with, with a company, and there was a 19-year-old kid, and some of you guys are probably 19. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the presentation, he spoke you know, near perfect English. He gave a presentation, and there are all the CEOs and so on. As I was leaving, I was going to my hotel, and I had a little 6 a.m. flight from Moscow to London. And, and I need to leave my hotel around 4 a.m. 
get to the uh, airport for my 6 a.m. flight. And this meeting ended at about 5 p.m. So what are you going to do? You're going to go back to hotel and sleep, right? It's just uh, it's, uh, very tight. And I'm running like, from meeting to meeting for, uh, uh, nonstop. One day per country is going crazy. We need to move fast, right? Our competition is faster than we are. So this kid gave the presentation. All the CEOs are leaving and shaking hands. And so he comes to me and goes, Mr. Tarkan, can I give you, a, a, can I have a meeting with you? I said, look, I'm leaving at 4 a.m. He goes, don't worry. And this is, by the way, Friday, so this is going to be Saturday morning. He goes, I'll pick you up from your hotel. What time? 4 a.m. I'll come to your hotel. I just want to show you my business plan. I'm like, this is interesting. And I'm thinking, the guy gave a great presentation, 19-year-old, perfect English, and has some idea. I'm all ears, right? You're always listening to this message. Um, I'm going to tie this to this story that I just gave you earlier. So I'm, uh, uh, I go back to my hotel. He comes in at 4 a.m. He basically, uh, with his friends, built this application. And it's basically Instagram, but the video and voice built in and works unbelievably. I mean, this UI, is, is user interface, is I've never seen something like this in my life. He goes, uh, this is our company, we need funding. I said, okay, we'll, we'll, I'll fund you, and how much do you need? So I'm expecting like typical US style, right? A million, three million, a hundred million. He goes, uh, we need three thousand three hundred six dollars. <laughs> I'm not kidding. True story. I said, that's interesting. Uh, I said, I'll wire the money. He goes, no, no, you cannot wire. This is Russia, you know, this, everything is being checked. I'm going to school, someone's going to come tax me, I need to be careful. We need, you know, I need cash. I'm like, okay, it's 4 a.m., it's minus, I'm not kidding you, minus 30 degrees. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, Russia, Moscow, minus 30 Fahrenheit. Okay, I'm not kidding. So literally, we are at 4 a.m. Saturday morning in, in the middle of freaking Moscow, working and walking from ATM to ATM to get, you know, 3,330 uh, dollars. <laughs> and rules, right? I guess one dollar is 7 billion rubles. So you just put your credit card and all these rubles coming out. I'm going to be running on our chat. It's like all sketchy. I'm kind of worried. So, but because of the Citibank security requirements in Russia, per ATM, I can get only $500. Do the math. You go to ATM after ATM, like seven ATMs, and I'm just, you know, this my, the story is this market is moving so fast. And there are so many unbelievably passionate, crazy people competing with us with country, in a, from countries that you've never been in before. And this is not a 30-year-old executive. This is a 19-year-old uh, um, going just to come stuck yourselves and build an application, working full-time in a country. <coughs> funding is not available. It's minus friggin' 30, okay? Don't complain about the weather here. Um, <laughs> And, and he is just trying to have enough money to buy three iPhones. iPhones are almost $1,100 there, plus tax. So he can do dual because the application was built on Android. Now they have an iPhone application. And I'm their biggest investor, $3,000 plus. I own a of the company. Isn't that a beautiful story? Only happens in this industry. The key message here is social mobile is part of this. Virtual is part of this. They're building contextual intelligence into the application. And the key, 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 key story for you all is don't go too slow. I'm telling you, worldwide, innovation is happening everywhere. From Moscow to Bangkok to South Africa to Trinidad. Be careful, you have tons of competition. You cannot waste your time here. Move fast, whatever you want to do. Be passionate about what you want to do, but keep moving fast. Power now. These people are moving so fast, and I'm proud to share this information with you. I share this, uh, uh, stories like this with, with the people I've been investing in. And even if this application fails, even if this company goes bankrupt, who cares? The idea is, I'm working with three, four kids in Russia right now doing development I've never seen before. I'm telling you, Google or Facebook do not have developers like that. And those kids are willing to work for free, just to an opportunity to sell and make a company and put their name on the, on the uh, uh, web universe. So just be aware of this. I just want to tie this the overall the uh, trends that I'm seeing around social, mobile, virtual, convergence, and contextual. Yes. Great stuff. <laughs> so very quickly, I think if you take one thing away, uh, Irrespective of the fact that Tarkan's kind of low-key and not very passionate about what he does. <laughs> um, hopefully you saw some, uh, uh, some truisms in his message.
listen, it is really, really important that even as a new graduating senior, you can find opportunities that are based on your passion. You really can. You don't have to settle for that entry level, first step job that you may not be crazy about. That's not to say that you might not have to at some point financially, but the, but the quest is to try to leave the gates as quickly as possible with passion and enthusiasm for something you're really excited about. And if you can map that to these bigger trends and bigger ideas and dream big, there really is opportunity, a special opportunity today exists for the new college grads in a way that has never existed before. The old rules of hierarchy where you had to do your stepping stones to advancement don't exist to the degree that you play in the technology world. And for those of you that are in the common world, that technology is completely uh, 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 re-engineered how the world of media and communication works as well. So with that, uh, will you stick around if some people want to come down and say hello? Absolutely. If you want to do Q&A, we can do Q&A if you have time. I, I, I'm not sure if you have time. I'll let them come in individually ask okay. you. One last, one last point. I yeah, no, sure. uh, these things are important for all of us to learn from each other. Anybody has a new iPhone application or idea, investment, or you're looking for a job, I'm on Twitter. Tarkan Miner, you that's the name I'm assuming you're here, right? Just connect with me. I'm very responsive because I'm looking for new ideas to invest in. So um, at, 30, at 30, 360 dollars. Yeah, of course. <laughs>